By the turn of the 20th century, railway traffic was increasing significantly. Longer passenger services and heavier goods trains were in demand, and as such, so were bigger and more powerful locomotives capable of pulling them. Most railways ended up double-heading their trains as a result. However, there was one railway in Europe that felt that what it needed to get the job done was some big boys. By 1910, the Royal Bavarian State Railways found themselves struggling with a peculiar problem. With loads getting heavier, they needed more powerful engines capable of pulling them, and while this wasn't much of a technical issue on most of their network, it proved to be quite the challenge on their southern lines which traversed the Bavarian Alps. Not only were these lines steep, some climbing grades of 2.5% for miles, but they were also made up of many sharp bends too, meaning bigger, stronger engines were usually too clumsy to handle the curves, and the smaller, more flexible engines weren't powerful enough to pull the trains on their own. Most trains required two banking engines to make it through the mountains, and even then they could only manage speeds of around 20 kilometers an hour. Furthermore, the rails could only support an axle load of around 15 tons, meaning that even if an engine was powerful and flexible, it needed to be relatively light on its wheels too. What the railway needed was an engine that was powerful enough to manage heavy trains alone and flexible enough to traverse the sharp bends of the mountain, but not so heavy that it damaged the rails it ran on. And in 1913, Anton Hamel of the Maffei Locomotive Works came up with the answer. A Malle locomotive. The Royal Bavarian State Railway was no stranger to Malle engines, and so ideas for a large tender engine with 20 driving wheels were given, as well as smaller 0660 designs, until finally Hamel came up with something satisfactory. He designed a huge 0880 compound Malay tank engine with 1,216mm driving wheels, measuring 17.5 meters long and weighing over 120 tons. The engines had two huge 800 by 640 mm low pressure cylinders on the front set of driving wheels, and two 520 by 640 mm high pressure cylinders mounted on the rear set, with steam from the boiler first being used by the high pressure cylinders before being exhausted into and used by the low pressure cylinders. The front set of driving wheels were mounted on a bogey and could freely swivel while the rear set were fixed to the engine's frames. Because the engines were intended for use at lower speeds, unpowered guiding wheels weren't necessary, meaning the entirety of the engine's mass could be used for adhesion, ideal for climbing steep grades. Classed as the GT 2X4-4, 15 were built between 1913 and 1914, with another 10 being ordered when the First World War halted production. Despite their lumbering size and relatively small driving wheels, the engines were capable of reaching speeds of 50 km an hour on relatively level rails, meaning they were just about capable of handling express work. Where they really shined, however, was on the mountain lines that they were built to traverse, with a single GT able to pull 670 tons up a grade of 2% at a speed of 18 km an hour, which is quite impressive when you consider most other engines prior needed up to two banking engines to help move a similar train at a slower speed. Some GTs even managed to reach 40 km an hour while pulling lighter trains. Not only was their performance impressive, but their sheer size, being some of the biggest tank engines ever built in Europe, made them very striking compared to the other engines they worked beside. So much so that they often found themselves on display at various railway exhibitions wearing colourful blue or yellow liveries and being adorned with crown chimneys. Outside of public events, however, they were mostly painted black. Their duties mainly involved pulling heavy goods along the steep mountain grades, but they were also often seen working as banking engines, for even working the grades of Lutic in Belgium during the First World War. In 1922, the other 10 GTs were completed with some slight modifications to the design, these being slightly longer, not as tall, and were fitted with larger firebox grates, bigger superheaters, and could carry more coal and water than the original batch. 
These, however, didn't perform as well as expected. Though still powerful, it's noted that at full throttle, the front low-pressure cylinders would be starved of steam and lose power, and when working as bankers, much of their weight would be put on the rear, high-pressure wheel set causing the front low-pressure wheels to slip. The pressure in the receiving pipe would then drop, causing the slipping to stop, only for the high-pressure set to develop too much tractive force and start slipping themselves. Around the same time, Prussian State Railways began designing a 2102 tank engine for use on steep grades, resulting in the Prussian T20 locomotives that quickly came under ownership of the Deutsche Reichsbahn. These were not only impressive mechanically, but proved to be more powerful than the Bavarian GTs while being 30 tons lighter. All 25 GTs too came under DR ownership, and in 1925, work began modifying them to bring them up to snuff with the T20s by making them stronger and more uniform. Changes included increasing the high-pressure cylinder bore from 520 to 600 millimeters, altering the blast pipe and funnel, reducing the amount of heating tubes, improving the superheater, fitting a feed water heater, fitting rig and back counter pressure brakes, increasing coal and water capacity, addressing the low-pressure wheel slip, increasing adhesive weight, and adding extra sandpipes to all but two of the wheels. Most of these changes were made to the second batch of GTs, with the first batch only receiving a few minor improvements. The upgraded GTs, now known as the Class 96s, were now more than capable of handling the work given to them. They quickly settled back into their goods work and banking duties, but by 1935, electrification was starting to take over. 396s had been retired by the outbreak of the Second World War, and in 1940, three were scrapped due to damage and number 96015 was lost in action, leaving 18 by 1945. They were stationed in Munich and Nuremberg after the war, but despite their power and flexibility, with less than 20 of the class left, they were seen as a splinter class, and so by 1948 it was decided that they were to be taken out of service. Two ended up joining the fleet of engines belonging to the Deutsche Reichsbahn of East Germany, while the rest were withdrawn. The final two engines were scrapped in 1954, having spent the last years of their working lives as static boilers. Tragically, none were preserved. While not the biggest engines in the world, the Bavarian GTs were still very impressive machines. Their dominating size, overwhelming power, and ability to scale mountain grades was something rarely seen in Europe, and while they weren't all perfect, they still managed to do their duties easily and then some. Just goes to show you don't always need anything complicated to get a tough job done. Sometimes, all you need is just a few big boys. Subscribe for more.